episode you are about to see is with Mary Stidham, who is a real estate agent in Bellingham, Washington. Mary has a really, really interesting journey to share with you on her road here to Bellingham from Hawaii to over to Arizona and then to Bellingham. She shares how she overcame an addiction to alcohol and how she coped with her recovery. She explains in detail her recovery. She's also involved with finding homes for the homeless community here in Bellingham and just a really interesting story and I hope you enjoy. Welcome to Inspirational Women. Please subscribe to this channel and remember to click the bell to be informed of new episodes. Joining me today from Bellingham is Mary Stidham, who is the managing broker at HomeSmart One. Welcome, Mary. Hi, nice to be here, Linda. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you for agreeing to participate. Nice to meet you. I hope we get to meet in person. I hope so, too. I hope so, too, yeah. once COVID is, is yes. no, once no longer. COVID. Yes. You have, in your resume, you state that you were went to school in Hawaii. Were you born in Hawaii? Um, I was born in California, and my parents moved to Hawaii when I was three years old. So I was raised in Hawaii. It was really nice. I really lived the ideal childhood. Growing up in, in Hawaii in the 70s and the 80s was was idyllic, safe, small town, really just a wonderful, wonderful experience. I'm I'm very lucky that I got to do that. That was that on Maui? No, it was on Oahu. Yeah. And then you went to high school in yeah. Honolulu. Yes. I went to Punahou, which is a private a private school, which uh, is the same school that Obama went to, actually. Yes, he's, he's about 10 years older than I am. His sister was in my grade. So yes, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful school. I'm very, very blessed that my, my parents were able to pay for that and that I was able to attend that private school. I'm still very close with probably 100 people, you know, <laughs> that I would get together with if I went home to Hawaii for our reunions and stuff. We still get together. So it it's, was a wonderful, wonderful experience. And you swam. Were you on the, you were on the swim team, right? I was. I was on the swim team. Yep. I swam from the age about nine until I graduated from high school. And then I used my swimming when I went to ASU, I became a lifeguard at um, Arizona State's rec center. That was that was a lot of fun too to be a lifeguard at the rec center. <laughs> there. Yeah, my son actually was a lifeguard at when he, in his youth. Helped yeah. pay for all those high fashion clothes that he wanted. Yes, and and lifeguarding paid really well as a as a young person's job. It was. Yeah. It's a great, a great, great thing. I have skin cancer and now. I've had tons of it. There were some price. I, I am definitely paying the price for that, but um, I, I still don't, I don't think I regret that either yet. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. That's but okay. that is under control. Yes, it's all under control. Yep. Good. When you were on the swim team, was it a competition? Did you? Yes. Yes, it was a competitive swim team, um, it, and I, I swam year-round in high school. When I was the most competitive, I swam up to five hours a day practicing, two and a half in the morning, two and a half to three in the afternoons. Yes. It Boy, was that's intense. dedication. Yes, it was intense. Yeah. Good grief. You, did you have any desire to train for the Olympics? I was not that good. I was not that good. Funny speaking, though, my my little sister was um, a kayaker and she went to the Olympics twice. Athletics is definitely in my family, but I was never my brother. I have an older brother who was a much better swimmer and he went to Olympic trials. He didn't make it either, though. I didn't even make it that far. So I was I was good, but I wasn't great. <laughs> but, but did you enjoy it? I loved it. I loved it. Yes. Probably kept you out of trouble, too. Probably, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so what prompted your move to the U.S.? Well, I went to, to Arizona State University, and I'm going to be honest here. My, my staying out of trouble because of by being on the swim team was thrown into the wind because I chose ASU because it was the number one party school 
listed in 1988 in Playboy magazine. And so I said, that's the school for me. <laughs> that's how I, how I chose Arizona. Really didn't know what it would, like, would be like to live in the desert and really had no concept of what it was, you know, the choice that I was making and what type of environment I was entering by living in Arizona. Arizona was a, I, I had, I spent 30 years there from the time that I moved there until the day that I left. And it, it was very hard to, to deal with the summers the entire time. I, I can't say I was ever a big fan the whole time I lived there. So it, it, you know, it's an easy place to live because living cost of living is very inexpensive, but mm -hmm. it, it's not, it's not a place I would choose to go again. It is extremely hot. We've just driven through and in July, which was oh. the worst month of all. And yeah. it was just horrible. It was worse than California. Oh yeah. It's a, it's a million times worse than California. Yeah. Now you studied early childhood education while yes. you were in university and yes. then you went on to teach. I did, yes. What prompted you to study early education? I love kids and I love their inquisitiveness and I really enjoyed teaching. I loved, I, I you know, I got a, a lot, I spent a lot of time with kids doing swim lessons and things like that when I was younger and in college. And I really just enjoyed their, their excitement and their happiness and all that stuff. And I really did enjoy teaching for the years that I did it. I taught first to second and third grades over the years. And I just, the, you know, watching kids grow and learn is delightful. It's, it's a lot of fun. I have to agree with you there. Yes, I have a niece that's a teacher and she loves it too. But there are challenges teaching. Oh, yeah. Today. Some children need more attention than others. And one of the challenges I had when I taught was we were right behind Intel where Intel's engineers worked. And so most of the parents were college educated. Pretty much every parent thought their child was gifted. <laughs> and that was, that was a challenge, you know, to appropriately challenge every child at their level was it was a, it was difficult, but I enjoyed the challenge. And then what prompted your move into real estate? I had children and that's what, when I stopped teaching is when I, I had my daughter and I stayed home for about three and a half years. Money was tight. Money was really tight. I decided I would go to work part-time and just, just earn a little bit, you know, sell, sell a house or two every, every few months. That was the plan. And it, it was immediately though a full-time career for me. As soon as I started. Yeah. It wasn't the plan to have it be a full-time career, but it, it turned into that. And it has been now for me since 2002. Obviously at that point in time, sales were good. At, yes. Sales were great from 2002 until um, 2005, 2006. Being in Phoenix when I was selling at that time, um, we felt the market crash early. I want to say I was, I knew it was pretty obvious that, that things were not shooting up um, as early as 2006, but we didn't hit bottom. The very bottom of the market, I think didn't actually come until 2011. It was a long downward. You've been very open about your struggle with alcohol. And can you tell us about your decision to stop drinking? What was the point where you said I'm done. Well, you know, this is this is not not a pretty story and, and unfortunately most people who who do decide to to stop drugging or drinking, it's not a pretty story by the time that they do make that decision to stop because addiction is 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 a disease and it's a really difficult one to beat. For me, what happened is my husband filed for divorce. In the the custody battle, my drinking w became an issue. I had to stop it so that I, I didn't lose any custody or time, parenting time with my children, because I was the main, the main parent for parenting time and stuff. And I, I definitely did not want that to lose that at all lose any time with my children. That was my bottom. My rock bottom was learning that that I could actually lose time with my my children. I went to rehab. Um, I was in rehab for about 40 days. And then I did sober living after that, which was a really important step because it, it teaches you how to live your life, your daily life with your 
with all the anxieties and all of the, the stress and all of the things that you go through day to day where when you normally would turn to a drink, you have to learn to find other ways to accommodate those feelings and those, those stress, those actions. I do think that the, the downfall of the market actually was one of the, the things that led me to drinking too much. It was very stressful to have sold houses to clients who were my, my close friends and have that house now be worth less than half than they paid for it, you know, a year after they bought it. it was It was horrible. I drank those concerns away. When I stopped drinking, I had to, I decided I had to sell real estate in a different way so that I didn't have, I didn't ever feel that, that I'd done something wrong, even though I hadn't per yeah. se done anything but wrong, felt that maybe I hadn't educated my clients well enough and maybe hadn't explained to them that the market was volatile and that, you know, or, you know, that you, there is no guarantee that what your house will be worth tomorrow. I, I took a really big step back from selling real estate. I was making lots more money when I was drinking than, than I did when I stopped drinking. But I, I educate my clients now, advocate for them in, in a way that I think everybody is with the, to benefit for it. I am because um, I'm really confident that all the decisions that they are making are the best educated decisions that they can make. I, I take a lot of pride in doing that, you know, in um, working for my clients, no matter if that means a sale for me or not. Can we just go back to, you did mention sober living. Does yes. that mean that you are elsewhere? Yes. Oh, oh, so you're not in your family environment in this sober living? No. How does that, I'm probably just like everybody else and don't understand totally the difficulties and the challenges that someone like yourself would go through I understand the rehab part. You would be away from your home yes. and then the detoxing, but the sober living, what, what is the purpose of that? Well, it's, it's like I said, it's just to, it's to teach you to deal with all of life's chaos, life's anxieties, life's disappointments without a drink. And so what it was is I lived in a, um, a small community of only women. There were four of us per little house together. Mm -hmm. And we, we had to, you know, we shared cooking we, duties. We shared cleaning duties. We took care of everything like that. And um, it was, I mean, it's basically like institutional living, but I made the closest friends that I've ever made in that time period because we were all going through the same thing. It was because re rehab is so, you know, you're away from everyone, you know, now this was, you're still not living at home, but you know, the kids came and I, I got to, to, to see the kids often while, you know, and they came in and hung out with me there. You know, you're more ingrained in the community in sober living. You know, you, you can work, you have your job, but you just come home there. You have accountability to stay sober. So you're not alone by yourself where you might choose to, to take a drink. Obviously you had good support in the community and was your ex-husband looking after your children at that time or did you have other family members that would help out? Yes, yes. My, um, my ex's family is, was in town and they did a lot. They helped out a lot. You know, my kids were eight and 10 years old at the time. They went to school, then his father would come and stay with them after school. Um, when I would normally, that would have been my, my role after school. And then, you know, then my, my ex came home and, and was with them at night. It was really hard for all of us. Yeah. For all of us. Yes. It was hard for him to, to have the, the responsibility of the kids all the time. It was hard for me to be away, hard for the kids. It was a really, really difficult thing. But congratulations, you did it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's so great, I think, that people like yourself would share their story because it can help immensely for someone else who is wondering, what do I do? I think that unfortunately, alcoholism and drug abuse, especially the, the um, pharmaceuticals, 
are a much, much bigger problem than people realize, than, than the normies realize. I think that um, there, are, there are so many people who have issues with drinking and so many people who have issues with drugs who are just barely holding on. That's why I shared my story is I wanted people to, to realize that there, there is life after that you can still be fun, you can still be joyful, you can still be a part of your community and out there in the world without the crutch of, of alcohol or drug use. Just my hope to, to have get somebody else to try. But I, don't, I didn't want people to think I was able to just say, oh, I'm just not gonna drink anymore because it's not that easy. You really have to learn a whole new way to live. Although I guess some people do that, but it's not the way for everyone. No, I think that if, if people try that and they fail, then they feel that, oh, well, I'm just a failure. I'm never going to be successful. And, and that's why sharing that, that rehab and sober living, both of those were very, very key in, in making, you know, making it okay to be brave enough to, to, to actually stop using. It's the times that you're alone, I think that are the most difficult. And since I had just just was going through a divorce at that time. You know, I didn't have my kids all the time, even when I was out. And those, those times when the kids were at their dad's house, those were, those were the most difficult. And that's where you have to learn to do something other than open a bottle of wine, settle down in front of the TV. And, and it, took, it took a while to get used to it. That's for sure. It, it didn't come overnight. But again, congratulations. You did it and you've been Thank 12 you. years sober now so that's yes. just wonderful yes yes thank you i i am proud of you i am i am proud of myself i am i i also am unique in the fact that i didn't relapse um i think when you tell people that you are not drinking when people know that you um are making an effort to to stop drinking that's really key because I couldn't go out with friends and have a drink. I couldn't buy alcohol at the grocery store just in case somebody would see me. It was out there. And so I, I had to, to I, I couldn't fail, I guess, put it that way, because it would have been too shameful for me. All of those, those things, I think a lot of people try to keep this secret. It's, it's a lot of times better to be open about it because those are the things that are going to help keep you sober. I think that's very true. I know for ourselves, if we're out with another couple and we know that they have issues uh, with drinking, I always ask, would you mind if I had a glass of wine? Yes. Because and some, for some people, it's okay. And others, maybe not. And, you know, I wouldn't want to be responsible for someone relapsing. Absolutely. And, and I think that that's, that's the polite thing to do would be to ask if they're okay. Now, for me, I actually am okay. Um, my husband, I, I just got married about less than three months ago. <laughs> and <laughs> Thank you. My husband does drink. He has to wear beer in the fridge right now. He'll have a couple of beers at night. I, I think I've been sober long enough. It is not something that bothers me. I, I am able to be around alcohol. I don't mind when people drink in front of me. In some ways, I kind of enjoy it be because those are still my people. And that sounds terrible to say. But, you know, the, the laughter and the, the jokes and all the things that happen when people get a couple of drinks in them, I thoroughly enjoy that as well. And I can take part in it as a sober person. And so I just would hate if people felt uncomfortable and didn't want to drink around me, if they chose, if they would have rather, you know, had a drink or two. Now, right. of course, people getting trashed, that's never fun. But having a drink or two when I'm out with a, another couple at, at dinner, if they have a drink or two, that, that's absolutely fine with me at this point. Yeah. What prompted your move to the Bellingham area? As soon as my children were done with school, I, I came. And um, that was something I, I never really loved Arizona. But once I was divorced, raising the kids with shared custody, there was no way that I could leave. Arizona is not a mother date where, where the mother gets any benefits over um, the child rearing. It's very much a 50-50 state. 
And so um, because the kids had all a lot of extended family in Arizona and stuff, they wouldn't want to leave. I wouldn't want to remove them from their father. So I, I stayed in Arizona until they graduated from high school. Now my daughter goes to Western. I did discover Bellingham because we toured Western. And I have to say she is, <laughs> she was not thrilled with me following her here. <laughs> but that's how I found it. That's how we, we toured it in 2015 and I just fell in love. Then you jumped right into the real estate market here. Well, I did. Um, it, and, and it took, it, it, it wasn't just overnight that I was able to earn a living doing real estate that it really took a while um, for me to, to find the, the base of, of clients of people that would trust me enough to, to sell them homes. Being new to an area is mm -hmm. makes that challenging. So the first, I want to say the first couple of years that I was here, I really spent my time. I took it as my job to learn everything I could learn about living in Bellingham. I tried to walk every trail. I went to every, now, now COVID is here, so we can't do this, but all, you know, in the summer when all of there's the art walks and the downtown sounds, and um, I went to a show at Mount Baker theater and I went to the, the Pickford theater and I went to, mm -hmm. I just, I did everything. I wanted to really get a feel for what, what living in Bellingham was like, really become kind of an expert. I walked all the neighborhoods and instead of just driving them, I walked them to really get a feel for them. I talked to people as I was walking. I, I really took my time to, to really learn, learn everything I could about, about the area. And, and I'm pretty confident now that I like, except for the plants, I'm still, I'm still terrible about plants to, to be able to say what kind of tree that is or what kind of bush that is. But other than that, I feel pretty confident in my, my ability to, um, advise people about neighborhoods and about um, what it's like living here in Bellingham. Did you have to take the, the real estate exam again? I did, yes. You yep. did? Yeah, had to yeah. take that again. Different license for different, uh, of course, there would be different legalities involved, right? In Absolutely, yes. yes. It's not that different than Arizona, I will say. The contract's different, but it's not the, most of Arizona and Washington are not that different in the, in the way that they do real estate. Um, we tend to, to both of us take after California, um, both Arizona and Washington state do. So we're all oh. pretty similar in, in real estate. Speaking of California, we moved from California to Bellingham in oh, two years ago, I guess, 2018. And at that time we had, it took forever to find even a rental. Oh it, yeah. Because the, there were just so many people moving from California to Washington. Absolutely. Is that it's, still the case? Are you oh, fine? absolutely. I have, I have clients right now living in a hotel they sold their home in Portland, Oregon, and they, they were kind of running away from the, the fires, which may have been one of the reasons you chose to relocate from California. Anyway, but they, they sold their home. It sold and it closed. And they have been here looking for a home since. And they've now been in a hotel as they're looking for a home for almost two months now. And we still yeah. can't find them that perfect home. And whenever there is one that they love, there are four or five other offers on it. It's a really, really competitive, challenging market right yeah. now. We were, we, you know, we were lucky and we had a dog at the time, which is no one wants to rent to someone. No. Dog, no. Even though he was 14 and he wasn't <laughs> going to chew up the place, but it was difficult. And then we were lucky we found this place up here in Birch Bay. So Yes. We're happy. Now in Bellingham, one of the articles that I read about you where you were talking about homes now in Unity Village. Yes. I wasn't even aware that that place existed. Tell it's us about that. Are you involved with that? Well, yes. So I live in Sun Valley and um, one of my neighbors here was Jim Peterson. Um, and Jim Peterson is, is the brainchild of, of Homes Now and Unity Village. He is also um, a person that pilfered money from the nonprofit, was arrested, and uh, um, 
is facing jail time for that. He was my neighbor and that's how I got involved um, with it. But I then uh, in, in a, a, I went by to offer to volunteer to help them out after, especially after Jim left, because I would, I didn't want the organization to fall apart. And I knew that they were struggling to, you know, to reorganize and keep it together after Jim was arrested. That's where I met my husband. <laughs> oh, for having sake. Yes. Let's, yes. Let's just tell people what Unity Village is all about in case they don't know about it. Unity Village is a uh, tiny home village that was built by all by volunteers and they're tiny homes, um, eight by 10 feet, little rooms. Every, every villager has their own little home with a locking door and it provides them a place to, to leave their stuff so that they can uh, find employment without carrying everything they own on their back and they can um, have a place to come home. There's showers there. There are, they have porta potties. It's not, it's not perfect. They have a kitchen tent, but it, it does, they still have a place to leave their stuff, lock their door, sleep every night. That's warm and safe. Mm -hmm. Gives them the stability to, to really get back on their feet and, and become a part of the community again um, in permanent housing. So it would be difficult to find a job when you don't have an address. It, it absolutely it is, is difficult to, to even get, get a job interview um, right. when you don't have an address. And then if you do manage to get that interview, um, if you show up with carrying everything that you own and maybe without a shower or your clothes aren't clean or, yeah. you know, all of those, those things, you know, when you're sleeping in a tent, maybe in the forest that you can't manage to get past. I just think it's a wonderful idea and really there should be more of them. That's actually the plan right now. Um, you know that there is the, the camp out on City Hall. I don't know if you're aware of it, but right now there's approximately 100 um, homeless people camped out on City Hall lawn. And they are, what they're, they're looking for is uh, an option other than the base camp, which is the mission. They're looking for, a, you know, a place to 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 live a life like it is in Unity Village. And so what they're hoping to do is buy pallet shelters. Now these, the homes that are lit are at Unity Village were hand built. These mm -hmm. are, these are shelters. These pallet shelters are ones that um, come pre-made and uh, you just put them together. They can withstand 85 mile an hour winds and you heat. Yeah, it's, it, they're, they're really, so we're, we're hoping the county will purchase some of these homes and all, all that's necessary to, to run a little village like that is that we need from the county or the city is the land. That's, that's the challenge right now is to, to find the land that, that these homes can be set up on. And, and also to get the county or the city to purchase them. Did that experience prompt you to write this letter or encourage people to write a letter to the mayor and city council members? No, that actually came from a group that I'm a member of, which is the Riveters Collective. And I'm a member of their justice system committee. And the justice system committee is the one that, that put that, that request out there. I'm just the one that posted it on Facebook. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> um, the, yes, um, we're, we're, we were looking for police accountability. Um, and and that, that stemmed mostly from the, the police that were found to have picked up a homeless mentally ill man as a practical joke. Um, they brought him to a restaurant to harass some recently off-duty police officers which it, it worked for them, but once the story broke, it, it's been really, really a, a negative mark on the police. And what, what we're, we were calling for is more accountability for, for that type of behavior from the police officers. So very disturbing. Very disturbing, yes. Yes, homelessness is a big problem and is even larger now that we are in a pandemic. It's unfortunate, really unfortunate. It really is. And I, I think you, know, you wonder sometimes how, I mean, it could happen to anyone. Yes. yes. You know, you, you don't have to be 
any specific type. It could just happen through loss of work, you know, anything. Absolutely. Um, there are, are it's, um, I believe that we are, most Americans in the United States are uh, two paychecks away from facing homelessness themselves. So that can happen, especially with COVID. And I, I, the fear is, is once the moratorium on evictions, foreclosures is lifted, that there, the homeless population is going to grow significantly. So it's a, it's a real concern because people are, they're not able to, to support themselves, especially with the shutdown of the economy, like there has been due to COVID. So it's, it's a scary, it's a scary situation for sure. Well, I see then that you, you know, you've supported the homeless and um, you're, think of yourself as an activist. You've also done some work with CASA. Yes. Which is court appointed special advocate. Yes. Yes. A CASA is a, a court appointed special advocate and they are an advocate of a child that is being uh, removed from the home or or being investigated to be removed from the home um, by the foster care system. A CASA is supposed to be the neutral third party that really advocates for the child instead of having an agenda like the um, CPS or um, the parents do you uh, your only agenda is supposed to be what is the absolute best situation for that child for the child and yes oh you go to court with the with the family and you you are are privy to all the meetings that they that they are a part of you go by the home and you get to meet the parents and you get to meet the caretakers, you meet the child and you, you get to come to, you know, make decisions using your own best knowledge and your education. You have to be, you know, they do, they do train you to become a CASA um, to decide what the best, the best uh, situation is for that child, taking all, all factors into account. I almost did that when we were in, when we lived in Marysville, I, again, when you're new and how are you going to get involved, yeah. become part of the community? I looked at that and thought I would like to do it and it had two interviews. And then the, the third interview was scheduled at a time we were moving back to California. So I may do that again once the restrictions are, are lifted. I think it's a very worthwhile. Absolutely. It, it really is. And it, it, it's a way to, to give back and volunteer, but know that you're making a difference. It's not mm -hmm. like just standing and, um, you know, filling plates in a food line at the, at the mission or something, you know, you're, you're actually getting involved in interviewing people and really uh, getting to know all the people in, involved in that picture. And it's, it's, you know, you really know that you're making a difference in that that role. It's an important role and it's, um, it's a valuable position. So it's basically a guardian ad litem, but volunteer wise. Are you still selling homes, Mary? Uh, uh, right now? Yes. Yes. That is, that is still my full-time career. And I've actually been significantly more busy the second half of 2020 than, um, okay. than when I, you know, the, the first couple of years that I lived here, it's been really, really wildly busy. I appreciate and it. Are your buyers local or are they out of state? Where are they coming from? Most of them are coming from out of state. Um, really? And and they're, they're coming from all over the nation, actually. Really? Yes, all over the nation. One of the reasons, one of the biggest reasons people are relocating to Bellingham are due to climate change reasons. Um, it, you know, the, the Southern states are too hot. The, you know, California with the wildflower fires, it's just, it's too much. People are looking for climate that is, is more moderate year round and is, there's a good water source here. It's also, I mean, Bellingham is also magical because it's still a small town. There's a lot of charm left you know here here in bellingham it's one of the most charming places i think that there there can be to live um so that i mean that attracts people as well but because there isn't a lot of business here people being able to work from home has really increased the number of people that are able to relocate to bellingham 
And I think that that's an, another reason that there are so many people moving here is because they don't have to go into an office anymore so they can live wherever they want. And people are choosing Bellingham. You know, we have the bay, we have the mountains, we have all the trails, we have all the outdoor activities that are possible, plus a charming, moderate tempered, temperature place year round. And the, there's a, a whole art scene here also, theater, oh. and I love. Oh, I do too. And, and I mean, it's just such a, such a wonderful, when, when COVID is not around, you know, all the, the wonderful, the art, the art th things that you can go to and the theater shows and stuff. I mean, there's, there are free, free um, performances in Maritime Park for goodness sake. And they're fantastic. The, the performances, they're done so well. So yes, it, there's a lot of things that we are missing <laughs> right now because of COVID here in, in Bellingham. And I can't wait until they come back. Well, thank you so much, Mary, for joining me today and sharing your life experience. I mean, I think that's such an important thing for you to be doing. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate that. And I hope that we do get to meet. I would love that. I would love to meet you yeah. sometime soon. Yeah. Thanks again. Thank you.